to Exodus chapter 17. Exodus chapter 17. And I, I debated on what I wanted to do this morning. Years ago, I preached along this lines on this subject, and the subject would be encouragement this morning. And, you know, it's been mentioned several times in the past few weeks out here uh, about having a circle here, having a group here, having a system of support here, and having a system of encouragement here. Is that what the church is supposed to be for, for our brothers and sisters? That is what church is. That is what church is uh, so much for, is for that encouragement. But if you remember, and some will and some won't, some wasn't here then, some was too young, may remember. Years ago, I preached along this lines, and I touched on this scripture some, and I had some of the big old football boys in here that thought they were really strong. And I thought about calling some out this morning, but, but I won't. But ask them how strong they was. And if they could hold up, and I can't remember exactly what I used. I don't know if it's a song book or what. If they could hold up a song book. We'll just call it song book. It might have been something else. But about the same weight or so. And of course, sure I can hold up a song book. So then I asked them to hold it straight out like this. For the entire service. Y'all remember that? He was standing over here, and I won't mention his name, but he was standing over here, and after a few minutes, it was a, you know, he was straining and stretching. That song book got a whole lot heavier in his hands after just a few minutes. You know, there's sometimes that something that we would look at as a small issue Shouldn't be any trouble to carry, to handle, to hold on to, to overcome. That might give somebody a hard time. Right? Especially over time. You see, sometimes when, when we first come upon something that we might struggle with, it's not a, not a hard thing to hold it up for just a few minutes. I'm just going to tell you, if you ever want to try this, just hold your arm out like that. Don't go down, don't go up, but I mean just straight out front. You see how long you can hold it there. Just your arm, just your own arm's weight. But at first we can do that, but you give it some time. You start getting tired, and you start sinking, or you start struggling, stretching, trying to do anything you can to hold it up. In our Christian lives, we are not immune from those problems that will weigh us down, that will burden us so much, that will tire us out, that will almost, if you will, illuminate our weaknesses and our lack of strength. It's at those times, church, that we, as the body of Christ, as brothers and sisters, need to be there to support one another. Today we want to look at these scriptures in Exodus that to me really uh, is a, a good example of getting victory when that support is there. So Exodus chapter 17, we want to start reading in verse number 8. It says, Then came Amalek and fought with Israel and Rephidim. And Moses said unto Joshua, Choose us out men and go fight and go out, fight with Amalek tomorrow. Uh, I will stand on the top of the hill with the rod of God in mine hand. So Joshua did as Moses had said to him and fought with Amalek. And Moses, Aaron, and Hur went up to the top of the hill. And it came to pass when Moses held up his hand that Israel prevailed. And when he let down his hand, Amalek prevailed. 
But Moses' hands were heavy. And they took a stone and put it under him, and he sat thereon. And Aaron and Hur stayed up his hands, the one on the one side and the other on the other side. And his hands were steady until the going down of the sun. And Joshua discomfited Amalek and his, pe and his people with the edge of the sword. And the Lord said unto Moses, Write this for memorial in a book and rehearse it in the ears of Joshua, for I will utterly put out the remembrance of Amalek from under heaven. And Moses built an altar and called the name of it Jehovah Nisi. For he said, Because the Lord has sworn that the Lord will have war with Amalek from generation to generation. Bow with me for word prayer. Father God, we thank you, Lord, for this day, for all you do for us, for that grace and mercy that you bestow on us daily, Lord. Father, we're thankful for your word. We're thankful for your provisions for us, Lord. Uh, most of the provision of salvation, but also, Lord, for the provisions of being a part of your church body. And having brothers and sisters that will support and strengthen us. That will edify us. That will help us. When times of trouble come. And Lord God, I'm just thankful today. For the love that you show us. God in sending Jesus to this earth. To be our payment for our sins. And Father God, I'm just thankful today that you call us to salvation. And God, I pray today that as we preach your word that you might just uh, preach it through us, Lord. That the words that said might come straight from you, Lord. You bring remembrance things we've looked at and studied. Let those be said, and Lord, those that or not from you, let it be forgotten, Lord. And God, I just ask you now to strengthen each one that is in this building this morning, and those even round about that may be struggling, that we know of, and those that we don't know of, Lord. And Father, I just pray that you might show us when we need to be the ones that hold up the hands of our brother and sister. Father, we love you. We thank you. I ask you to forgive me of my sins, Lord. Cleanse me that I can be used by you. In Jesus' name I pray these things. Amen. <coughs> the first thing we really want to look at here is the Amalekites. They were a, a group of people that they were uh, marauders. They would come in and raid your camps or whatever and they would steal and they would take stuff. They would plunder. And they were always kind of nipping, if you will, at people's heels. Just always being in aggravation and always standing up against God's people as they came through the land to go to the land that God had promised them. Now the Amalekites were the descendants of Esau. Now, you remember Isaac had two sons, Jacob and Esau. And you remember the strife that there was between those two brothers. That did not die out with the death of those two brothers. It kept on going. And so here, these descendants of Esau, the Amalekites, coming against uh, the descendants of Jacob, so to speak, the, the Hebrew people. That, that fight continuing on. God said, I've had enough of it. Y'all are my chosen people, and this people is an aggravation to you. And they seek to hurt you and we're going to do something about it. And so there was war with the Amalekites. And you can go on down through uh, the history of Israel. 
uh, for so long and there was always fightings with these people that stemmed all the way back to Jacob and Esau. Uh, you can look at Saul when he became king. He fought with Agag, which was a descendant of the Amalekites, which was a descendant of Esau. And God told uh, Saul then, he said, I want you to get rid of all of them. Wipe them off the face of the earth so there won't be a problem anymore. You know what Saul did? Didn't obey God. And that's why God took away his kingship and then gave it to David. He left Agag alive. And you come on down through history, you know who was a descendant of Agag? Haman. You remember in the book of uh, Esther? Haman and Mordecai. Mordecai was the Jew and Haman hated the Jewish people and he kept devising ways to completely annihilate and get rid of the Jewish people. God said, no, that ain't going to happen. We're going to turn what he had for mischief against you on his own people. And Haman was actually hung on the own, his own gallows that he had built for Mordecai the Jew. So there is always this strife and always this fighting between them. And I mention all that because is there some things that keep on coming up and reoccurring with us? I mean, there's some things, you know. We deal with it one time and it's not too bad. And then well, we have to keep on dealing with it. Keep on dealing with it. It gets tiring. It gets heavy. It gets burdensome. And it weighs us down. And that's when we need our brothers and our sisters to come along beside us. God told Moses, he said, y'all go out and fight with these people. And you take the rod and you hold it up. And as long as you're holding it up, Israel is going to be uh, prevailing or winning, so to speak, in the war, in the battle. And sure enough, that's what happened. We just read there. We won't go back and rehearse all of the years. But they went out and they began this battle. And as long as Moses stood up on the hill and he held the rod up. And I want you to know, he was an older man at this time. He wasn't no spring chicken. But I'm going to tell you, even if he was a spring chicken, if he was young, them arms would still be getting heavy. Amen? You know, it don't matter where you are in your Christian walk, there's times that your arm gets heavy. You might be one that has just been saved, and I mean you're on fire for God and just seemingly invincible. Y'all remember that? Y'all remember them times? I mean, you first got saved, and you was like, come on, Satan, we're going to battle. You was ready for it. You was excited for what God was doing. Sometimes we're not quite as prepared as we thought we was. Sometimes then we get beat up a little bit. And those things start weighing on us. And we have to have help from our brothers and sisters. If we're smart, we'll get help from our brothers and sisters. I'm just going to tell you something. We were never meant as Christians to be maverick Christians. You know what I mean by maverick? To be alone. To be loners. To be by yourself. God created the church. He established the church for us to be able to come together as a congregation and draw strength one from another and edification one from another. Not to just be out here on our own alone. People say, well... It don't really matter if we come to church. I can watch it on TV. You can watch it on TV. Listen, you can watch this on YouTube. But that does not take the place if you're physically able and can be at church. It does not take the place of sitting here with your brothers and sisters and drawing strength right from them because there's a lot you miss if you just watch this. There's a lot of testimony service you miss, a lot of singing service you miss, a lot of things that people are going through. Say, hey, I've gone through this, but God help me this way that this person over here is going. That's what I'm going through. And if you got help that way, maybe I can get help this way. Listen, God meant for us to be a congregation of people that come together to help one another. Amen. 
Moses here. Listen, let me go on with what I was saying while I go. If you were young, you still can have problems. You know what? After you've been in the way for a long time. Brother, how long have you been saved? You're a math man, so I'm asking you. been saved. Do you still have things that get you down? Weigh you down? Sure. It don't matter whether you are fresh, newborn babe in Christ or whether you are mature, been in the way a long time Christian. I'm going to tell you, Satan wants to beat you up either way you are. Amen? And he wants to throw things that will weigh you down and get you down and make you trip and stumble and fall. I'm going to tell you something. Don't get the feeling that, well, I'm, I'm, I'm a mature Christian and I shouldn't need anybody's help. I'm good enough now. I shouldn't need anybody's help. So I, I'm just, I'm not going to humble myself and ask for help. Do we do that? Sure we do. People's not going to understand. I've been in the way a long time. I can turn it on myself. I'm a pastor. I'm a preacher. I've been preaching for a good while now. Since 98. I'm not going to do the math. Y'all can do that. Do I have things that makes me weary, makes me tired, makes me stumble, makes me trip up? Do you know what's tough sometimes? It's tough for me that knows better, that knows the Bible, that knows what I should be doing that people look to for spiritual advice have to seek spiritual advice. I'm just, I'm, I'm just as human as anybody. Amen? Amen? And I'm just as arrogant sometimes as anybody can be. We can all be that way. So it don't matter whether you are a preacher, whether you're a singer, whether you're someone who's just holding the door. We've all got this stuff, right? Moses, I mean, Moses had been around the block. Moses had seen some things, and Moses had done some things by the power of God. I mean, Moses, he held up the rod of God, didn't he, at the, the Red Sea? What happened? I mean, that's the same Moses, the same rod. Moses could have, could have got up there and said, you know what, I'm Moses. I've got this same rod. We did this stuff before. Y'all stand back and watch this. Held it up. They were winning. All of a sudden, Moses thinking, this ain't easy as it was the last time. And he could have said, no, boys, no, I got this. I don't need no help. I'm Moses. But he didn't do that. Because he's seen what was happening. I'm going to tell you something. When our battle starts raging and, and we start maybe losing the battle and we start getting uh, beat up a little bit, so to speak, does it just affect us most of the time? It's going to affect more than us. It's going to affect your family. It's going to affect those around you, your friends, uh, maybe those in your workplace, in your school, in your church. It's going to affect more than just you. And that's what Moses was looking at as he was up here surveying the landscape. Surveying the battle. And you know the first few times his arms started to drop. And he seen his brothers and his sisters getting killed in battle. You know he probably resolved I'm going to do all I can. I'm going to hold them up. But then listen, we're human, right? Right? And we've only got so much strength within us of ourselves. And the arms started coming down. But you know what happened here? Let me just go back and look at it. But in verse 12, but Moses' hands were heavy. And they took a stone and put it under him, and he sat there on And Aaron and Hur stayed up his hands, the one on the one side and the other on the other side, and his hands were steady until the going down the sun. Was anywhere in that reading that Moses said, Hey, boys, y'all might have to help me out here? 
Maybe he did, but it doesn't say that he did. But you see, they were standing there watching what was going on. And they seen their brother. The hands start to sink low. And they seen what was happening on the battlefield. And they said, we've got to do something. And they made the provisions for Moses to sit down then. And I can just, I can see them one on one side and one on the other. And they probably sit, either sit down there beside him and just propped them up like this. Or they stood beside and just held them to where they could stay a lot longer. And they stayed all day long to the going down of the sun. And the children of Israel prevailed. They won the battle. They won the fight. Was it because of Moses? Or was it because of all those involved? Moses couldn't have done it without the two beside him. You know, I, I love football. And for many reasons. Not just entertainment, but there are so many similarities, so many things that you can draw from what goes on on the football field and in preparation and everything else that would coincide with even the Christian walk and the Christian life. And y'all know I preach several times different messages that goes along with that. And I thought about uh, this very fact right here. Can one man win the ball game by himself? Not at all. It takes everybody around. You're only as good as the people beside you. You're only as good as those that are supporting you beside you. Well, what about how good the quarterback is? If he ain't got nobody to block, he's going to get killed. Right? He's going to get hurt. If he's got nobody to catch a pass, He's not going to get very far. If he's got nobody to run the ball to give him a little break with his legs, he's going to get tired in a hurry. Amen? You see, we need all those around us. Whether it be a football team, whether it be church, I think about uh, the army and stuff. You're only as good as the person beside you, the one that's got your back, the one that's looking out for you when you're looking this way, they're looking that way to make sure nobody sneaks up on the backside of you. Listen, uh, we as Christians are to walk circumspectly. In other words, we're always to be watching around behind us, but there's sometimes Satan uh, tries to catch us in a blind spot, and it's a good thing when a brother or sister says, hey, Satan's trying to plan an attack over here on this side, but I got you. I seen him coming, and I diverted him a long time ago. Amen? Amen. Ain't that what we're supposed to do as children of God? We need to have each other's backs on that. As I was thinking about that thought, I thought about, y'all ever seen that little shirt? It's got stick people on it. And uh, y'all know how, how my mind works. And it says on there, I got your back. And it's got one of the stick people reaching in and grabbing the other one back and jerking it out, right? So all of a sudden, that one don't have a back because the other one's got his back in his hand. Sometimes, is that the way we do? We say, I got your back, but you're really tearing something away from them. Instead of actually having their back and watching their back and, and making sure that Satan don't get to them and do what that little stick figure just did. I want to look at a few things on elsewhere in the Bible. Ecclesiastes, <clears throat> chapter number 4. I said a while ago, we were never meant to be maverick Christians. Now, with that being said, I'm not going to say there's not sometimes you'll have to stand alone. God does uphold us as well. We're, we're probably going to read a scripture in Isaiah 41 about that in a minute. But he didn't intend for us to always be alone. Ecclesiastes chapter 4 We'll start reading in verse number 9. It says, 
two are better than one because they have a good reward for their labor. For if they fall, the one will lift up his fellow. But woe to him that is alone when he falleth, for he hath not another to help him up. Again, if two lie together, then they have heat. How, but how can one be warm alone? And if one prevail against him, two shall withstand him, and a three cord, threefold cord is not quickly broken. Two are better than one. Do you know Jesus, when he sent the disciples out, how did he send them? Two by two. Sent them out in twos. He understood this principle. He understood that he that they needed someone in their travels to be on guard or on the lookout. When one is in the forefront, the other one's in the back watching what's going on. And vice versa. It says, for one falleth, who will be there if they're alone to lift him up? Any of y'all ever fallen before? I should have heard amens all through the house this thing. Yeah, we've been pushed down too, huh? <coughs> but what if you fall and you hurt yourself? I'll, amen on this side. I was going to say. <laughs> and you don't have your phone and you don't have one of them things that goes around your neck that, you know, help I fall and I can't get up. You know, you know what I'm talking about, right? And you have hurt yourself trying to do it on their own. And maybe they got the wrong crowd around them and when they do fall, those Christians just look at them and so go, you shouldn't be down there on the floor and turn and walk off. Amen? Amen? It's important to surround yourself with those that will help you back up when you fall. Amen? Moving on, I do want to turn to Isaiah chapter 41. Just to reiterate what we just said, Isaiah 41. says, Fear thou not, for I am with thee. Be not dismayed, for I am thy God. I will strengthen thee. Yea, I will help thee. Yea, I will uphold thee with the right hand of my righteousness. So I am thankful that when we are alone, God can uphold us as we even think about Moses. God could have upheld Moses' arms. I mean, he could have. He's God. He can do that. If he can hold the world up, he can surely hold one man's arms up. But you see, sometimes God lays that responsibility on us. God's way of help, God's plan of help is for us to come alongside our brother or our sister. That's what he had planned for Moses then, was for them to come alongside and to be the help that Moses needed at the time. There's scripture, one place that says, and it's a shame if we do like this, if we see one that's in need, and we see them in need and we go up to them and say, bless you, be warm and filled. And then we turn and go the other way. When we have 
an abundance over here of what they need. It's at that time we can say, well, God, God was going to help them. God was supposed to help them get, get a meal. When you had, you know, two burgers over here or whatever. Maybe God was going to use you to give one of those burgers to that guy. Amen? That's what I'm saying. Sometimes God has it for us that we are a part of that plan to be the help. And not just say, God's going to help you. God's going to help you. God's going to help you. Listen, we might be part of that plan for God's help for them. We need to be paying attention. Amen? We need to be an encouragement to our brothers and our sisters. Acts chapter number 11. We're soon going to come to a close. Acts chapter 11. One of the greatest encouragers that we really find in the Bible. In Acts chapter 11, verse 22. It says, these then tidings of these things came unto the ears of the church, which was in Jerusalem, and they sent forth Barnabas, that he should go as far as Antioch, who when he came and had seen the grace of God was glad, and exhorted them all, that with purpose of heart they would cleave unto the Lord. For he was a good man, and full of the Holy Ghost, and of faith, and much people was added unto the Lord. Now I want you to know what he did. In verse 23 it says that he exhorted them all. The same word is used many times. Edify. As exhort. When, when we are uh, at church. That is our goal is to edify. And exhort. Is to strengthen. To build you up. Not build you up to be arrogant and prideful and boastful. That's not what we're saying. But to build you up in the Lord. To, to, to uh, let you know that, listen, we all stumble, we all fall. But God is a God of great grace and great mercy. And He helps us up. And He heals us. And He strengthens us. And He'll do for you what He's done for me. And He'll do for them what He's done for others. We are to be that support structure for them. Barnabas was a support structure for Paul and many of the other uh, uh, disciples. Listen, he was there. He didn't take the limelight, if you will. But he was there supporting in prayer and by watching their backs and by doing the other jobs. He didn't have to be in the limelight. He didn't have to be out front. He was content just doing what God called him to do, and that was to be an encourager. Barnabas, like I said, we could read several things uh, concerning him and different things, but I just want you to know he was an encourager, encourager, and that's what we need to be is a bunch of Barnabases, encouragers. So how do we do that? How do we do that? Uh, 1 Thessalonians. <clears throat> First Thessalonians chapter number 5. It says, Wherefore comfort yourselves together and edify one another, even as also you do. There you go, that edifying, that encouraging, that uh, comforting. It's also, that word is used interchangeably sometimes with comfort. We are to, to be, like I said, that support system. To edify one another up. How do we do that? Well, for one, our words, right? Do our words have strength in them? More than we realize. Your words 
In the book of James, it talks about your tongue. Your tongue has the power to destroy or it has the power to build up. My, how powerful it is. I'm just going to say this. A lot of people, they work out and they have these big old muscles, you know, and you think, well, look how strong they are. That's not the strongest part of their body. Your tongue is by far the strongest part of your body. It has more strength to do more good or more harm than any other part of you does. Amen? We need to be ones that use our tongue, use our mouth to speak words of encouragement. You don't know always what somebody else has gone through that day. Yeah, they might be down in the ditch and you don't know how they got there. They might be needing somebody to come along and to speak a word of encouragement to them and say, listen, that ditch ain't too deep that God can't help you and get you out of it. And then help them out, which would be my next thing. Not just, as we talked about a while ago, to, to, uh, to just say, you know, I hope you get out of the ditch. But as you reach down, Give them an arm. Pull them out. Help them out. We can be great encouragers by the actions that we take. Not just speaking it, but putting our words into action. We can be encouragers by having empathy. This is how I define sympathy and empathy. Sympathy is feeling sorry for somebody. You know, I hate you're going through that. I hate you're going through a, a knee operation, brother. I hate it. That's sympathy. I hate you're having to go through the pain and whatever else is involved in it. I hate you're having to, to yeah. I hate you're having to put up with, with his pain and all that. <laughs> But I can't quite have empathy for you. I don't know exactly how you feel. Because I've never had knee surgery. Now you know what? You've had knee surgery. So you see somebody else come along. That's had knee surgery. You can feel the empathy for them. You say I know how you feel. I've been where you're at. Everybody in here. Can have sympathy. For somebody that's going through something. But we can't always have empathy for what somebody else is going through if we've never been there. But those of us who's been in a certain place, been through a certain thing, listen, I've said this, it's been a while ago, don't waste what hard time God got you through by keeping your mouth shut when you see somebody else going through that exact same hard time. If God has brought you to it and brought you through it and you're on the other side, listen, you need to be a help to somebody that's in the exact same place that you were. Because when you were in that place, did you feel hopeless? Did you feel like there wasn't a way out? Did you feel like you couldn't make it? That person's feeling the same things. And... No one can better understand that than the one who's gone through it. You know, Brother Daniel was here preaching about where he'd been and, and what all he'd come through. He said something to the fact, and I've said it to him too, you can reach people that I can't reach. You've gone through something, you can reach people that I can't reach. If I've gone through something, I can reach people that you may not be able to reach. We need to be that person that has empathy and be the one that reaches out and helps them in the time of need. We need to be present. <laughs> Sometimes we like to just disassociate and you know, go away from a situation. For us to be an encourager, maybe we need to be in the situation as well. We need to not just speak but we need to do. And I'll close with this. Is that not what Jesus did?
Jesus came to this earth and he experienced everything that we do. Yet he's without sin. You see, he overcame the world. And all the traps and all the snares of the devil, all the trip-ups, he overcame them. And you see, that's why when we can't stand on our own, which really is never, but when we try to stand on our own, you see, Jesus understands what we're going through because the Bible says He was tempted in all points as we yet without sin. He knows what it's like to be in the situation or at the front of the situation. But you see, He also knows how to go around that situation, to overcome that situation with the Word of God. And because He knows what we go through, what we face. He is there ready to pick us up wherever we are at. Because we couldn't pay for our own sins, He went to the cross to pay for our sins. That's putting words into action. That's being the one on both sides that's not just saying, keep trying, you, you, you just got a little longer, keep trying. He didn't do that. He went all the way and supported him. Listen, he went all the way to the cross and he stretched his arms out for all of us. He overcame sin, but not only did he overcome sin, he overcome death. He overcome the grave. overcome all of that. Because, the Bible says, because that we have been made more than overcomers. We got to look to Jesus as our one that strengthens us and helps us. We look to Him as our example then to be that to someone else. Brother, if you want to get you a song together, I want to have a couple verses. There may be someone in here this morning that is just come to the end. Can't make it. I'm going to tell you, Jesus is one that will uphold you. And I'm just going to tell you, if you need to come this morning, if you're not saved, you need to come and pray this morning. Listen, you come and you talk to Him. And you know what we as a church will do? We'll get around you and pray. We can't save you. But we can sure be watching your backside. Make sure Satan don't have an avenue to come in there and mess things up. Amen? That's what He's given for us to do. We'll kneel with you. We'll pray alongside of you. If you're here today and you're a child of God and things just going on in your life, we'll come up and we'll pray and kneel beside you as children of God, as brothers and sisters, as an encouragement, as a help. When your arms have gotten heavy, God, I pray that we're always the people that would be there to support and lift you up. While we stand and while we sing, would you come?